Hello, my name is Amanda Bellows. I would like to welcome you to the National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Institute, the visual culture of the American Civil War and its aftermath. Today, we are going to talk about American slavery and the period that followed emancipation in a comparative context. We are going to contrast the abolition of Russian serfdom in 1861 with the abolition of American slavery in 1865. Then we are going to compare the visual culture of the post-emancipation era, studying the ways in which American and Russian businesses deployed advertisements depicting African-Americans and Russian peasants to sell products to consumers. We will examine a series of images together most of which are photographs of trade cards, posters, and ephemera from Russian and American archives. Images I collected while doing research for my book, American Slavery and Russian Serfdom in the Post-Emancipation Imagination. Advertisements were just one type of media in which representations of African-Americans and Russian peasants appeared during the 50 years that followed emancipation. In fact, Russians and Americans of diverse backgrounds responded to the emancipation of enslaved African Americans and Russian serfs through cultural production in mass oriented literature, lithographs, oil paintings, photographs, and more. In these media, they represented serfdom and slavery and peasants and freed people in fascinating and evolving ways. Today, however, we are going to take a close look at depictions of African-Americans and Russian peasants in the different types of advertisements that I mentioned earlier. First, I thought it would make sense to begin with an overview of American slavery, Russian serfdom, and emancipation, since the historical context will inform our interpretation of the visual culture from the post-emancipation era. American slavery and Russian serfdom were two contemporaneous systems of forced labor that began in the 1600s and ended in the 1860s. In 1649, in Russia, the Tsar and his government passed the Law Code of 1649. It inserted the Russian peasantry who composed a significant majority of the population. Peasants were now bound to land owned by members of the aristocracy or by the state. Now, serfs who were unable to move freely away from the estates on which they lived or worked um, were now forced to pay rent to landlords. Um, and they shared with these landlords the same ethnicity, the same language, and the same Russian Orthodox religion. The nobility exercised a great deal of power over serfs. For instance, they could legally beat their serfs with rods or whips. They could sell them with their land at will, um, as seen here in a a painting from the post-emancipation era. They could forbid serfs from marrying. They could exile them to Siberia. And they could force peasants to um, become conscripted in the military for periods of service that lasted for decades. Many masters sexually abused or raped their serfs who had no legal recourse. Serfs were not allowed to file civil lawsuits against their landlords or against other serfs without their owner's permission. Thousands of serfs resisted these oppressive restrictions by fleeing from their estates or even through violent rebellion during the 18th and 19th centuries. Russia's Tsar uh, in the 1860s, Alexander II, abolished serfdom in 1861 by issuing an emancipation manifesto that freed 40% of Russia's population from servitude. What prompted him to do so? Russia's defeat in the Crimean War, an international conflict lasting from 1853 to 1856, contributed to his decision to end serfdom. 
After losing the war, Tsar Alexander II, uh, the second and his advisors realized that substantive societal reforms, including the abolition of serfdom, were necessary to modernize the military, largely made up of conscripted peasants, and the economy. Most of the nobility, however, did not want to free their peasants because they relied upon serf labor to provide them with income and because they saw the institution of serfdom as durable. Seeing that they could not prevent the autocratic czar from abolishing serfdom, many nobles decided to participate in drafting emancipatory legislation in order to minimize their losses. Between 1857 and 1861, government officials and committees of provincial nobles and their deputies crafted the terms of emancipation. In 1861, Tsar Alexander II issued an Emancipation Manifesto which summarized these terms for the hopeful peasantry. Emancipation immediately changed serfs' legal status from serfs to free rural inhabitants. This meant that landlords could no longer buy or sell serfs or transfer them to different states. The Emancipation Manifesto also granted freed serfs the right to make contracts, sue their landowners, and choose their own spouses. Two years later, in 1863, the government issued charters that enabled estate owners to allow peasants to purchase household allocations of land. In exchange for the permanent use of the land, however, the peasants were required to make redemption payments to estate owners over the course of 49 years. And the fiscal burden of these obligations was quite high and effectively bound the peasants to the land, much as sharecropping in the United States kept freed people from leaving the South. For decades, peasants largely remained in place as the communes responsible for collecting these payments did not let the peasants leave until they had fulfilled their debts. Peasants actually made these redemption payments until the 1905 revolution when Tsar Nicholas II canceled the outstanding payments and taxes and permitted peasants to move freely about the country. American slavery began in 1619, when the first enslaved Africans were sold to the colonists of Jamestown. These men and women came from present day Angola. They spoke a Bantu language called Kimbundu, and they possessed important farming and husbandry skills. After being captured in West Africa, they were sold to Portuguese slavers and transported across the Atlantic Ocean on a, sh on a ship called the San Juan Bautista on its way to Mexico. During their journey, 50 to 60 African, -American, uh, African men and women were captured by two English privateers, the White Lion and the Treasurer. Then they were sold to the settlers of Virginia at colonist John Rolfe recorded, quote, the best and easiest rates they could, quote. During the centuries that followed, thousands of enslaved Africans came to colonial America on a horrific journey that became known as the Middle Passage. Of the 12 million Africans who crossed the Atlantic Ocean as part of the transatlantic slave trade, 10 million reached North America, South America, and the Caribbean, while 2 million perished aboard tight-packed slave ships. Slavery expanded in the United States as the slave trade surged during the 17th, 18th centuries. By 1861, when Confederate rebels fired on Fort Sumter off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina, starting the Civil War, there were 4 million enslaved African Americans in the United States with a property value in the billions of dollars. As in Russia, enslaved African Americans were treated brutally by their owners. They were forced to perform agricultural or domestic work, working from early in the morning until late at night. They were treated as chattel, as human property and subjected to whippings and other forms of physical and sexual abuse, including rape. 
Slavery existed throughout the United States, but was concentrated in the U.S. South, where enslaved African Americans comprised about 33% of the total population. As in Russia, many enslaved African Americans resisted and sought to escape from bondage. A primary difference, however, is that in Russia, serfdom was legal throughout the vast empire, although it was less enforced at its borders. For serfs, the prospect of escaping um, to freedom was difficult to imagine. By contrast, uh, formerly enslaved African Americans in their autobiographical narratives right of how they imagined Canada and the North, where in many states, slavery had been abolished. There, free African-Americans established thriving communities where men and women could build families, churches, and work for themselves. Some African-Americans attempted the dangerous journey to freedom, using networks supported by anti-slavery activists to reach the North. As in Russia, Others staged rebellions, physically fighting back against those that kept them in slavery. Decades of anti-slavery activism on the part of black and white abolitionists preceded the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. When the war began, there were 4 million enslaved African-Americans who composed 13% of the total US population. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued an Emancipation Proclamation that freed enslaved African Americans in the Confederacy and permitted Black enlistment in the Union Army. The Civil War's end in 1865 led to the ratification of the 13th Amendment in December of that year, which permanently abolished slavery in the United States, um, except for punishment as a crime. After abolition, Freed people strove to exercise their newly acquired rights. They sought to locate and reconnect with long lost family members from whom they'd been separated under slavery. Freed people established schools and universities to gain literacy and a robust education. They signed contracts for paying jobs, started businesses and built churches where they could worship as independent communities. Free people faced significant anti-Black racism, however, that influenced the dynamics of the post-emancipation era. The gains achieved during the period of Reconstruction, which lasted from 1865 to 1877, and included acquiring, included acquiring citizenship and the franchise for Black men, were challenged in the Jim Crow era. States passed discriminatory legislation that denied rights to African Americans, White supremacists enacted campaigns of violence to enforce racial sub subjugation. And the Supreme Court ruled that segregation was constitutional in the Plessy versus Ferguson case of 1896. Although 1,500 African Americans held political offices during Reconstruction, white supremacist violence and the passage of laws restricting Black Americans' ability to vote uh, sought to curtail their political power and their voices. Now let's talk about the aftermath of emancipation. In both Russia and the United States, the fight for peasants and African Americans to gain rights and build lives outside of slavery and serfdom occurred during an era of geographic expansion, industrialization, and urbanization. As both nations expanded and extended their borders, they gained access to natural resources that fueled industrial production. Industrialization led to the establishment of factories and manufacturing centers that provided jobs for rural to urban migrants. In the United States, 4 million jobs were created between 1889 and 1919 in the manufacturing industry. Both immigration and rural to urban migration led to the dramatic expansion of cities and urban areas during the late 19th century as well. The total US urban population nearly tripled between 1880 and 1920, growing from 14 million to 54 million people. 
Russia also experienced rapid urban growth with the number of urban residents tripling during the second half of the 19th century and into the early 20th century as well. In Russia, the movement of peasants to cities where wage paying factory jobs offered a steadier stream of income powered much of this growth. Some 50% of Russia's urban population were peasants. As in the United States, both the number and size of cities multiplied during this period. The migration of free people also drove urbanization during the late 19th century in the United States. 200,000 African Americans migrated northward and westward between 1890 and 1900. Drawn to urban centers by the possibility of a better education and wage paying jobs, approximately 25% of all African Americans lived in urban areas at the turn of the 20th century. Industrialization and urbanization also led to the rise of advertising and consumer culture. Manufacturers offered consumers a wider array of products for purchase than ever before. How could businesses reach potential buyers and convince them that their products were superior amidst the growing competition? The answer was through advertisements. Businesses took advantage of the explosion of print culture that coincided with rapidly rising literacy rates in both Russia and the United States. They placed advertisements, often featuring illustrations of their products in newspapers and illustrated periodicals. Businesses also created colorful posters that they affixed to the sides of trolley cars or pillars or that decorated the interior walls of public establishments. A Russian or American consumer strolling through the streets of New York or St. Petersburg would have been bombarded by visual ads wherever he or she went. American companies advertising budgets grew from 30 million in 1880 to 600 million in 1910. U.S. businesses worked with newly formed advertising agencies whose experts helped them create advertising campaigns or images tailored to sell products to specific consumer groups. For instance, the advertising agency J. Walter Thompson promoted its skills in customizing advertisements to buyers, writing in 1902, quote, our intimate and profound acquaintance with newspapers and magazines here give an impressive advantage. We can ensure that automobiles shall not be extensively advertised to the working classes, nor bargain jackknives to the well-to-do. The advertising industry was less developed in Russia where businesses typically contracted advertising design work to individual artists, placement agencies, uh, placement agents, copywriters and so forth, rather than to agencies. Although advertising uh, budgets in Russia were slower to ramp up, businesses' expenditures on advertising mirrored those of European and American countries by the turn of the 20th century. How did businesses appeal to buyers through advertisements and what messages did they send? One strategy that both Russian and American businesses employed was that of using marketing materials to reach consumers who were troubled by the pace of industrialization and the rapid shift from rural to urban life. For example, many advertisements featured pastoral imagery that sharply contrasted with the hustle and bustle of everyday life in crowded, noisy cities. Other ads were retrospective, creating nostalgic representations of rural uh, Russian and American life that whitewashed the brutal histories of slavery and serfdom. Both American and Russian businesses deployed images of African Americans and peasants in positions of servitude to sell products to white and non-peasant consumers 
In the United States, some ads presented racist and violent imagery, a decision that may have reinforced and normalized the white supremacist violence that devastated black communities during the Jim Crow era. So many advertisements from this period depicted African-Americans and Russian peasants in positions of slavery, serfdom, or servitude. Let us take a closer look now at some of these images to try and discern advertisers' strategies and messages to white and non-peasant consumers. In this late 19th century advertisement for I.V. Papp's tobacco firm, we see a group of male and female peasants harvesting tobacco and loading the leaves onto a train, an image that combines both traditional and modern imagery. The elaborate costumes of the peasant workers draw inspiration from those of medieval Muscovite Rus, while the train serves as a visual symbol of the industrial age. The peasants are also pictured as children or childlike, a decision on the part of the advertiser that makes them appear submissive, obedient, and even non-threatening. I would argue that this scene would remind the late 19th century viewer of serfdom, even though the peasants' status here uh, as an unfree or free laborer is ambiguous. Here is another image that combines traditional and modern imagery as it shows peasants completing field work. This is a poster for Henry Lance's agricultural machines that was likely produced during the late 19th century. We see male and female peasants threshing wheat with the help of an enormous machine that undoubtedly makes their work more efficient. And such machines didn't exist in the era of serfdom. However, Again, I would argue that the viewer is meant to remember serfdom through the decisions of these advertisements artists. For instance, many of the peasants are wearing traditional clothing and we see a man, a non-peasant here, dressed in Western clothing, who's overseeing their work, standing at the foreground of the illustration and looking directly at the viewer. He seems to represent the figure of the nachalnik or boss who controls the peasants who were most likely once serfs themselves. Now we move into the domestic interiors of upper middle class Russian households. This is an advertisement for F. Turbin's folk tea. We see a Russian family as they prepare to have tea in their parlor. You can notice the brass samovar in the middle of the table. There are clear signs of material prosperity. The father holds a newspaper. The different members of the family wear extensive black leather shoes and the latest fashionable clothing. The father relaxes in his chair, holding a teacup in one hand and a newspaper in the other. They can afford a household servant, represented by the peasant woman at the center of the advertisement. Is she uh, a serf? Is she a free peasant? Was she once in serf? Again, her status is deliberately unclear, but the viewer is reminded of serfdom because she wears traditional Russian peasant clothing rather than the Western clothing worn by the members of the family. Advertisements like this one were aspirational, targeting members of the rising middle class who might desire to move upward in Russia's social order. By purchasing products like tea, a formerly expensive luxury item only once afforded by Russia's elite, but now more affordable in the late 19th century, they might envision themselves as participating in an exclusive pastime that was once the realm of pre-emancipation era aristocrats. Here we have an image that is quite comparable to the one that preceded it. This is an advertisement for Pavel Gorbunov's fruit tea and coffee produced during the late 19th century. The previous advertisement appeared on a wrapper for the tea itself. Here we have a large colorful poster. Again, we see a family dressed in expensive Western clothing being served tea by a peasant woman uh, in traditional clothing. The family sits on the porch of what appears to be an estate in the country, perhaps one that was once funded by the profits of serfdom. As on the tea wrapper, 
the peasant woman's status is ambiguous, but the allusions to a nostalgic, sentimental vision of serfdom are evident. Now let's move to American advertisements. Here we have an example of a trade card, which was one of the most popular types of advertising ephemera during the late 19th century. The illustrated card was one of a series that consumers were meant to collect. It was produced by W. Duke Sons and Company, a Durham, North Carolina-based tobacco manufacturer run by a Confederate veteran. W. Duke and Sons created many sets of souvenir cards that consumers would find inside cigarette boxes. This series, produced in 1888, describes 48 American states and territories. On the front of the card, uh, there's uh, we see an image of the state, which here is Alabama and the governor. The back of the card contains text describing the conditions and the history of the state. Discussions of slavery in the Civil War, however, are conspicuously absent from trade cards featuring states from the former Confederacy. On this trade card for the state of Alabama, we see the white male governor in a prominent position. His portrait is on a higher plane than those of the adjacent pictures. On the right, we see an image of an African-American boy picking cotton. He appears to be content in his position. And his status as a slave or freedman is uncertain. This image is similar to those of Russian advertisements we looked at earlier. As in Russian advertisements, we also see American advertisements in which African-Americans are portrayed in positions of domestic servitude. Here we have a trade card for Boston-based Chase and Sandborn's seal brand Java and Mocha, described in the text on the card as, quote, the aristocratic coffee of America, quote. The elderly man on the front of the card speaks admiringly about the brand of coffee. Referring to so-called, referring to his so-called mistress uh, in dialect, as he says, my missus says there's no good coffee in these parts. Spec she'll change her mind when she drinks seal brand. Why did Chase and Sanborn use an image like this to sell coffee? Whom was this company targeting when it produced this racist caricature? This image likely appealed, uh, this image likely reminded white middle-class uh, buyers of the idea of the loyal freedman, an imagined character who regular, regularly appeared in the so-called plantation literature of the era. Uh, not only the literature, but also the art, um, which was produced by white Southerners. Like the middle-class Russian consumers who imagined themselves as aristocrats drinking tea served by loyal peasants, White middle-class American consumers, particularly women, might have imagined themselves as elite Southern women in an advertisement that overlooked the horrors of and the grim post-emancipation legacy of slavery. This slide is um, for H.E. Taylor's Furniture Polish. This advertisement um, is even more explicit in its representation of Black servitude, but I think it's targeting the same type of consumer. On the right side of this trade card, we see uh, a black woman polishing a brass lamp, while on the left side, the white employer cleans uh, a piano. And here, the women are working alongside one another. By contrast, this pamphlet for the company Enoch Morgan's Sons depicts an African-American servant kneeling before her white employer in a dynamic that echoed that of the, post, uh, the antebellum era. The pamphlet tells a lengthy story and only two pages are shown here. The white woman described as a quote, lady who much discomfort knew because her pots and pans and kettles too were never bright and shining. Her servants at the labor hard were all the while reclining quote. So the black woman is unable to effectively clean the kitchen in this story until she begins using this product, the polio soap. And the racist overtones of this advertisement are quite clear, particularly in the advertisement's conclusion that, quote, the tablet white as snow ensures that uncleanliness quickly fades away. 
One additional way in which African-American women were represented in positions of servitude during in late 19th century advertisements was through the image of the mammy figure. Now the historian Kenneth Goings has argued that images of enslaved black women who cared for the children of their white owners regularly appeared in advertisements from the post-emancipation era because he writes, quote, what better way to provide the consumer with a sense of racial superiority than the stereotypical Old South, New South myth of the loyal, happy servant just waiting to do the masters, now the consumers, bidding. Quote. We see evidence of this type of representation in a trade card here for Dixon's stove polish. Here a white child is held by her black caregiver who removes the black stove polish from her white skin. Now, thus far, we've talked primarily about the parallels between nostalgic representations of Russian peasants and African-Americans during the post-emancipation era. But it is important to note one critical way in which depictions of former serfs and slaves diverged. Racism significantly influenced advertisements produced by white owned businesses during the late 19th century. We see evidence of this in ads that depicted violence against African-Americans that masqueraded as humor. These horrific ads circulated during the 1880s and 1890s when lynching rates reached staggering highs and white supremacist violence shattered black communities. For example, in this advertisement from 1882, for Rawson's Railroad and Steamship, we see an African-American family on their way to a church meeting. The train, driven by a white engineer and named the Sunny South, runs into them. They lose limbs and their dismembered bodies fly into the air. It is a truly shocking and gruesome representation. In my research, I did not find comparable images of violence against Russian peasants in advertisements. By contrast, I located posters and other types of ephemera in which peasants are represented as equals to different members, uh, to, different, to the members of different classes in Russian society, including merchants, aristocrats, and so forth. Here we have a poster for cigarettes, for beer, and for another kind of cigarettes. What accounts for this difference? Well, the lack of racism in Russia, in the Russian context is one significant factor. Another factor to consider is that of purchasing power. While African-Americans composed a demographic minority, Russian peasants made up a demographic majority uh, with growing purchasing power that advertisements, uh, that advertisers wanted to tap at the turn of the 20th century. So I mentioned earlier that 40% of Russia's population had been enserfed um, and they were held by private, private owners. Uh, another 40% were actually state-owned peasants. So peasants made up about 80% of Russia's entire population um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. By contrast, in the United States, we have uh, American businesses owned by white citizens that are deploying denigrating images of African Americans in advertisements designed to appeal to white consumers. Meanwhile, Russian manufacturers were likely incentivized by peasants' national demographic majority to depict them in positions of equality to convince them to buy their products. Well, uh, we've run out of time for today. But please know that these images are just merely a handful from the thousands that depict African Americans and Russian peasants during the late 19th century across a huge range of sources. I'm really looking forward to talking with you uh, later on and to answering our questions, to answering your questions during our live session later. And I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you so much.